as sorry we delayed at the beginning and then i forgot to hit record so i'm okay. recording now it cannot be recorded <laughs> um right so you know i think that's something and i think they say in this report that that influence is going to get um more pronounced yeah what is it as the ocean levels come up it's coming up this coming up the river um, and that will change that will change a lot. So I think these, I thought the, these communities really are looking at flooding, flooding. I mean, they're they're on the coast for them. So so that would, but the municipals, the municipalities that are on the coast, which is, I guess, was my question, is that the DEP has to recognize that these these communities are also experiencing these heavy rainfalls, but they're not really being active. What is the climate? Change Institute have to say. Have to say. <laughs> you know, I, I got. Yeah. A, I had a. I had a question about that for you. I I was reading through the methodology, and it talks about sea level rise, and base flood levels. So I'm assuming that the base flood level is a is related to precipitation events, and then the sea level rise is to do with the level. You know, ocean levels. Obviously, I'm. That's my assumption, but it wasn't clear to me how the um, precipitation events were being calculated. But when, when I looked through, through the sea level rise section, which is like 1.3 section four, there's a little equation in there that the Army Corps of Engineers uses for their civil works programs. So I did the calculation for 100 years, for a 100 year sea level rise. And the answer I got was 0 0.193, 194. But there was no units, so I'm assuming that it's meters. But that seems very low for a 100 year sea level rise. Um, and I've got a feeling that if they're using the IPCC numbers, the IPCC in the past has always underestimated the sea level rise because they don't take into effect the melting of ice. They don't take in, they don't calculate calculate you know, disappearing glaciers and ice sheets and catastrophic collapse of these things. So, you know, in, in a lot of the reconstructions that we do at the Institute and that we recommend people do in their um, climate action plans and resilience plans and their vulnerability assessments is we recommend like doubling it or tripling it. Mm -hmm. So, so I, it would be interesting to know what they're actually using as their sea level rise projection. I, the calculation I had just didn't seem to make sense, so I don't know. Well, a, a lot of that storm and ocean level rise data is based on observations over the past 40 years. So you're working with the ramp up to an increase, but you don't know what's going to, you know, it's not going to, you don't know what's going to uh, steepen the curve. You're just making assumptions based on previous data if you're making a model. So yeah, if your model is all for less, you know, you know, climate change back in the 70s and 80s, you know, you don't know what it's going to be in, in 2030, 2040. Yeah, and they use linear calculations as well. They don't they don't try and calculate calculate step changes, which are completely possible. Right. So I would just suggest that um, most of the stuff we get from our engineer when we talk about WPCF is in feet as opposed to meters, but that could maybe be different. I know nothing. I, I don't make calculations and I don't, I know not even enough to be dangerous. However, um, I am happy to ask that question, Dan, to Dan Piasecki, who is the gentleman who wrote this report and to give you some understanding to help put it in context if that's helpful yeah, it'd be great to see what his calculated 100 year sea level rise number was and what the units are yeah Thanks. since dan piasecki is he talks way up here dan he's not a volunteer resident expert he's just an expert <laughs> um and um, I might just copy you on my request and have you guys talk back and forth and between you, I might grasp it. And if I don't, I'll ask you to help me sure. understand. That would be great.
so this is just a thought I had. I don't know if it would really help anything. Um, my guess is that not a lot of people know that these combined sewer overflow events happen on a regular basis. Um, if people were aware of this in some way, would if they, for example, took shorter showers or reduced their water use, would that in any way help with this? Or is that just a small amount of sort of things? Like if there's an alert during this time, please you know, so, reduce your water use. Is that gonna help in any way um, doing that? So I'm gonna talk and then Joe's gonna correct me. But I think that our issue is some of infiltration, um, I and I into the system, but just generically like into pipes and manholes. I think a lot of this is coming from the fact that we have a lot of people who have homes built in wetlands because Orono is a lovely marsh of wetlands um, and have sump pumps and foundation drains that instead of draining into the storm system, will drain instead into the sewer system. And um, I don't know that there's any way to help people um, not do that. But when we are overflowing at a rate that is greater than our daily um, normal flow, um, that kind of tells us that it's, I don't know if that would work. I also will tell you that Joe and I struggled for a while. We were all set to start a process of telling people that they had to um, disconnect from the sanitary sewer system. And in order to do that, we had to evaluate our storm system because uh, we couldn't ask people to just disconnect and not do anything, you know, not connect to something else. And when we looked at our existing um, storm sewer, we are severely undersized and very old. Um, it is, um, we are in dire need um, of upgrades in, this, in the storm sewer systems. And we have several areas within the sanitary system map that don't have um, storm sewer. So, if, if we had a place to just wave a magic wand and make it all go away, that's how I think we would attack it. I think when you look at the low hanging fruit, the town has done an awful lot with regard to lining lines, um, taking care of old manholes, uh, putting rings and covers on manholes to try to tighten things up. We've got a significant um, cross can cross piping where we've got a storm, a storm drain going into the sanitary system that we've been working for two years to get out because yeah. the pipe is not reachable. Um, so I just, if it makes people feel better, I think we could do that. Um, you know what I mean? If, if it makes people more cognizant of the issues, uh, from our perspective, um, we don't really publicize the CSO events. Um, I think partly it feels like a little bit of a, a failure at times. I generally will write an article for the Observer. That, that talks that about it. talks about it. Uh, I try to put one in at least once a year. Uh, and so that people know that there are CSOs happening in, in Orno. Uh, but you're right, I don't think if they stopped using that water, it wouldn't, it just wouldn't matter. I mean, right. our, our peak flow on the last CSO event was 7.2 million gallons before you could get to it. And, and we were running just over a million, right? Right. We're running, time. we're running a million, a million, million two on a normal day. Uh, and when that started raining, it's called, it called him at, at uh, well, would have been part way through the, the rain event, and by the time he got there, we were at 7.2 million gallons. Yeah. They would have called him at 5.65. That's how much water. So, even if people just like completely stopped using water and sewer, it would still not really 
Well, yeah. you're talking about it wouldn't one, have a significant impact. But you're talking about the 1.2 million that we normally would get. Yeah. If if that, I mean, you know, diurnal flow, we're down to 600,000 most most nights. I mean, it, it's it seems that most of that flow is is coming from the precipitation leaking into the sewer system. I don't think. I don't think if people stopped flushing their toilets through the storm, it would make much difference. So, yeah. You see it on the flow chart, it's come, comes right straight up. It's coming. Yeah. I don't know. It's coming through the manholes or what it is. You know, we have, we every time we do a project, we change, we change the rings and covers for gasketed manholes. Uh, a lot of the, you know, a lot of these projects we've done, they're not bolted down. Which is what they call for, on on you know for the for the real water over the top, but they're but they're gasketed for a couple of reasons. But they keep the water out and they keep, they keep the neighbors happy. So, <laughs> they don't hear them ringing. But yeah. so a question that I had, and you can help me with this, Joe, is is if you do have watertight manhole covers, right? The water comes down. Where it has to go somewhere. Yeah. So our, will our streets be flooded? We'll be we'll be we'll be looking at flash be flood more situations. Streets flooded, yeah. Yeah. So what's the remedy for for that? Well, like Sophie said, I mean, we're we're just, working. It's just like between the hard place, uh, you know, a rock and a hard place. Right. I mean, the sanitary. Yeah. I mean, the sanit. If we can button up the sanitary, we still got to fix the storm sewers. There's still the storm sewers yeah. that still need to. Get. And when you mm -hmm. consider that a lot of storm sewers are old galvanized culverts, culverts right in the ground that rot on the bottom and stay in place, mm -hmm. that's where you see a lot of the sinkholes happening. Is when they finally let go and the gravel is um, worn away and then you lose the top. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a, everybody likes to think about the top of the road and how beat up it gets and how we need to put more pavement on it for the traveling public. We need the pavement to help shed the water into the ditches and the storm drain mm -hmm. system. Um, and then we really need to spend time and money mm -hmm. um, trying to rehab and upsize our our storm drain system right so right. one thing i don't know if this is helpful or not but i worked a lot on combined sewage overflows um, in new york city so very different environment but one of the things they really wanted to invest in heavily was like green infrastructure to be paired with like gray infrastructure and so they like did like what do they call them now um, but they were like enhanced street tree pits near every, um, near like specific sewage, near like, sorry, storm drains where they knew they were going to have lots of problems. And they, you know, calculated the capacity that those tree beds would hold. And it was pretty substantial when you think of them as a network. Orono is already pretty porous. So I don't know how, like how much that contributes, but I'm just thinking of the downtown area and what that, what that might add to the kind of green infrastructure? I, I think we need to rethink um, how we approach things. Um, Council um, Finance and Operations Committee is gonna hear that um, on Monday, they're going to hear that town staff um, would like to focus very carefully on stormwater. Um, we'd like to bring in a stormwater um, coordinator or an environmental services coordinator to help us look at ordinances to help us identify those kind of the low hanging fruit are there are there simple things and the other thing that um, we have been talking around at the staff level but have not brought to council yet but are going to I think begin to uh, talk about is the idea of a storm um, sewer uh, district or utility. So um, taking, uh, so when people decide to build impervious, make impervious services, 
um, that they um, would get charged on the basis of how much impervious surface they're putting in. And then they can get credit for green um, efforts that would uh, mitigate um, the runoff. And uh, City of Bangor has done it. We've always been kind of opposed to adding more fees because Orono has a, a high property tax um, rate. But when you're looking at people making decisions to create big parking lots so that they can, um, you know, hold cars um, and maybe not using good buffers and not, you know, just making decisions that that are more um, in line with traditional development as opposed to some of the newer ideas. We're wondering if some financial impact to that might um, help people make some better decisions. I don't know. I'm gonna start talking about that. Yeah, I guess my thought is like, since we don't know, we don't know exactly what is gonna happen in the future, but we know that we're likely to see more extreme weather events, more intense rainfalls more frequently. Um, it makes sense to invest in a great infrastructure and be really thoughtful about where we put our money, but also to think about like all the different ways that we can make an impact beyond just, you know, because if you build a wall, a wall around the, you know, pump station or, you know, what have you, and the water goes over the wall, do you, are you just going to keep building a taller wall? I hope not, but yes, I, I see exactly what you're saying about that. Absolutely. Hopefully, she grows. Right, exactly. Um, one other thing, too, and um, and I don't know where the committee is, if you have any more questions, but there's a, there's a whole part about funding and the timeline mm -hmm. and things like that. And I, I don't know if the committee knows how WPCF is funded and like it's not all taxpayer. Well, it's not taxpayer it's not money taxpayer. at all, right? Yeah. So um, WPCF is based on user fees. Um, so we charge um, $5.95, 85. 85, yep. $0.85 cents per 100 cubic feet with a base of 1,200 cubic feet that everybody pays. Everybody is treated the same. Um, when you do that calculation and consider that the University of Maine is a, contributes uh, about 48% uh, of our rate um, revenue, um, they are a huge um, player um, for us. So um, the town, um, it's all part of the town. However, it's an enterprise fund. So it operates separately from the town. We, I actually charge Joe for administrative services and taking tax, you know, taking the sewer payments and, um, doing the liens and you know all of that all of that stuff. Um, right now, um, and council heard this from me during the budget process, right now we are severely underfunded. We are not charging a rate that keeps up with the amount of money that we need to, to put into the ground. Um, cost of construction has way outpaced um, our rate structure. So um, we're looking at, at, at ways that we can hopefully make that better. You know, the thing, whether you're talking about trash or, or sewer. <laughs> we got a big day today. Or so water. <laughs> yeah, it's been, a, it's been a busy day. Trash today. Um, the problem that we have is in the cost of the general infrastructure and the readiness to serve far outweighs the, it, 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 the per cubic foot charge the, the, um, that has to pay for that general service mm -hmm. means that we on the financial side want people to use lots of it. On the environmental side, we would prefer that they not. We, you know, we, it would be great if people would um, not use as much water and be more thoughtful in what comes into the sewer system. And, send less trash to the landfill. 
we've got to come up with a different setup in ultimately in a more global uh, thought process, a different setup for how we pay for yeah. um, these, these uses, because we should be encouraging people to um, use them less and still contribute to a, right. a high quality system. And I think it's probably worth mentioning that, is it only one third of the town of Orono is even on public sewer? Did you say about one third? Plus the university. I mean, yeah. Right. Especially so, land wise. I mean, we're we're running fourteen hundred customers. Right. So you know, so I'm on Bennett Road, so I don't have public sewer. I have public water. So it's pretty. I mean, so not it's everybody. Basically, here the is, village district. Right. Is, it's is, the village district that's supporting the right, WCCF plus the university. Plus the yeah. university. So not everybody is even part of that. So that's another funding issue. You know, issue. Forest right. Avenue or. Right, right. And I'm not that far out Bennett Road, but I think, you know, Tom, I mean, it starts, I don't know where it starts after noise, maybe, that we start, that it starts. Two houses beyond septic, noise. Yeah, that, that it starts becoming that more, of a, it's a septic system instead of a public sewer Winter system. Haven is, was, Winter Haven is the last place. Winter Haven, it's okay. On sewer. Yeah. Yeah, Joe's got it memorized. <laughs> I know, I always ask. I it. have to look at the map still. <laughs> So I don't want to take a ton of your time, but I just I want I wanted to introduce our system, and this is our first um, foray into um, looking at climate action, you know, adaptation plans to try to do some planning. Um, and I think um, it is a way that I'm also hoping to connect this committee in more with operations. Um, if we are able to um, really begin to sink our teeth into environmental services or stormwater, those are things that I would anticipate coming to this committee to kind of get vetted before they go to town council. So I would expect you guys to be working with staff to kind of help us navigate um, some of those ideas before we take them to council. Sounds good. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's a great group. It is, it is a good group. Any more questions for Joe and Sophie? Good. Thank you guys. Thanks, um, thanks. for that. Yes, yeah, thanks thank for coming. And um I actually you, I got one one quick question. So you mentioned earlier that we have a license for the CSO. Um is that based on volume or events? Number of events or volume? There's no, there's no, the license isn't based on anything. The CSO discharge is part of our MEPDIS permit, or MEPDIS main discharge, discharge permit. permit. So that's, that's, that's part of that. Uh, there are no, there are no constraints on it. I see. <laughs> So if, it's, so if it overflows a lot, we don't get fined a, a, a huge amount. It, it's just a matter of, it's not great. It's not a great thing to do, <laughs> you know? So I'm gonna say, we don't know about the fines because in our, fi our last five year CSO master plan, thinking ahead and wanting to be proactive mm -hmm. and knowing that the University of Maine is a significant, you know, joins us in, contributing to CSO events, we put in the CSO master plan that we wanted to do a SSES, a sanitary, sanitary sewer, sewer evaluation, evaluation study. study. Yeah. There we go. Um, with the University of Maine. Um, and uh, the University of Maine did not have the funds to fund it. We asked twice, we offered to pay for half of it. Um, and we just, in our initial report that went with the next five-year master plan, we said, we've made every effort. It's not working. It's not our property. Um, we can't make them do something. So we're just, we can't do that. But here are all the ways we're working with the university. And we got a new person overseeing the CSO program with DEP who bid into that and the town of Orono ended up paying for 
a, an SSES study for at the University of Maine. We got a $15,000 grant to offset a $60,000 project um, that told us exactly what we already knew. And um, we have been fighting with DEP um, because they were threatening some pretty hefty fines for us not being in compliance with our master plan. So they don't say it's because of the master plan. They say I'm not in compliance with my discharge permit because I'm not following my master plan. And so it's an interesting world that we live in, Dan. Um, <laughs> yes, it is. And luckily, we have a great relationship with facilities on campus that lets us go pull manhole covers and do all sorts of things that most entities probably wouldn't let us do. Um, so I'm hoping that as yeah, we I mean, move forward, it will be a little better. They send their people right with us, with yeah. ours. They do a great job. It's yep. just not good enough for Mike Riley. Yeah, maybe we need to get rid of Mike Riley. <laughs> that problem can be solved. Yes. <laughs> Only not by us. Good. Anything else? Okay. Well, thank you um, I'm for this. Stay with you You're going to stay? I think George is okay. going to. George. <laughs> I think um, Joe is going to go home. That's why we put you first. Thank you very much. So, appreciate you, it. Could, so you could come do your thing and then. And then I appreciate go that. Home. Thank you all. Good. Thank you. Thanks, so the Joe. next thing on our agenda was a presentation by Adriana, but I haven't seen her. Um, did she get in contact? She didn't contact me, and if she did, I haven't checked my I haven't checked my email. Did she contact anyone? Um, something might have come up for her. Um, so she was going to share with us her um, her MFA project, and also uh, to work with um, try to find a way to. Uh, integrate some of her um, ideas, uh, recycling as resource. So hey, we Cheryl. Yes. Sorry. Um, I just dug deeper into my emails and realized that she sent an email to me alone. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't catch it because it was part of a thread um, that there were multiple replies on. Okay. But she said um, she's sick. Or, or her daughter's sick and she's not feeling well, but she has a couple of updates, um, doing some sort of an online art exhibition for Maine Recycles Week. Yes. Was awarded a grant for purchasing materials for recycling workshops. Um, yeah. And we could use this as an opportunity to get the community involved and she's searching for indoor spaces to get this started and she can share all of that soon. Okay, great. Thank you, Belle. I, I Sorry, just, I missed that. Okay, yeah, I hadn't heard from her. So I didn't. Um, and so I didn't, I just thought she was going to be, she was going to be here tonight, but she's pretty um, conscientious. So I'm sure something like that had come up. She's got a great uh, project. And I really, I can't wait for her to share it. And she's very in, she's very invested in um, getting the community involved. Um, but she has an interesting way of taking trash. I've seen her presentation and I'm working on her committee, her MFA committee um, this, this year. And well, it'll be about six months. And um, she takes a, she, she uses um, unrecyclable trash. Um, she's collecting it. She's, she's got a whole bunch of stuff going on and she's turning it into uh, art projects but they're also um, things that you can put plants into and hang on your wall and they look really good. And she's, they, they look wonderful actually. And so she's creating these projects in these workshops um, for ways to use trash. And I know Brie has talked to uh, Adriana too um, at length um, to ways to use, uh, to take trash out of the, um, uh, out of the stream, out of the waste stream um, and use and make, something into them that's usable. So it's a really nice, she's got a really nice approach. Um, it's art in juxtap juxtaposed with recycling and reduce, reuse. And now we have reduce, reuse, recycle and resource. So we're, so we were kind of talking about four R's instead of the three R's. So she'll come back and um, maybe we can do a presentation um, either next month or 
sometime, but she's very bright and very interesting um, person on our, on our committee. Um, the next thing on the agenda is updates on the community sustainability projects. So window dressers um, and main recycles is just kind of at the forefront right now. And um, Dan is working on, um, he's supervising the AmeriCorps um, students. And I had a chance to talk to Deb today and the project is um, getting ready to go. We have over, she said, we think, she thinks about over 100 um, inserts at least, if not more than that to put together at the Methodist church. And Dan, can you, I, you're more involved in this than I'm, I'm helping. I'm a helper in this project. <laughs> so you, you want a quick overview? Yeah, just a quick overview. So are you, are you all familiar with what, what the window inserts are? Didn't I show you one week? I thought you I grabbed it and held it up. But anyway, okay. a window insert, it's basically a small wooden frame that's wrapped in UV resistant plastic, both sides, then with, you know, um, draft stopping foam tape around the outside. And they're, si they're sized to fit exactly in a window frame. So at the beginning of this process, someone will come to your house, measure your window frames. Each window will be labeled individually because they're all different. Um, the interior frames are usually all different. So you'll get a, an insert specifically sized for your frame. They go in, they, they squeeze in, and they create two areas of dead space, one between the insert and your window and the other in the insert itself, between the two sides of the, of the clear plastic. And they really make a huge difference. They're relatively cheap to produce. Um, they're the brainchild of this window dressers, rocklandwindowdressers.org, this company. They've been doing this for, I think, for over a decade. And um, they've turned it into kind of like a community event. So they call them community window insert builds. And anyone in the community can volunteer to go to this uh, event and help build these inserts that are often going into houses of, of low income community members, making a real difference. And um, if you order window inserts yourself, you're required to do, I think, one four hour shift for every 10 inserts or something like that. Um, I've got them throughout my entire house and they make a massive, massive difference. I have to say, I used to sit at my kitchen table and, and work, you know, do email and I would end up with freezing cold feet. So, and once I put the inserts in, I noticed the difference immediately. It stops that convective flow and gravity driven cold air from coming down across the floor. It really makes, changes the comfort level by a couple of notches. <laughs> so, so yeah, so, um, so I helped out with the Indian Island build, um, the last, uh, that was on campus with Sharon Klein. Um, so I got a chance to actually be part of the, the build. So I'm looking forward to Orno's build, which will be November 9th through the 13th. So we're looking for volunteers right now to come in and, and to help. Um, but um, Deb has been a, a AmeriCorps volunteer and she's done a lot. She's, she's done a lot of work and on getting this um, up and running. So I'm hoping, um, to make this an annual um, for Orono so that we can be part of a weatherization project, which would also be part of our climate action, kind of part of our climate action plan. So it's yeah. moving, it's doing it. <laughs> so yeah. they, they, another thing about them, they, they go in and out easily. They just slide in, slide out. We need a safe place to store them over the summer. Mm -hmm. uh, um, before I used them, I used, used to use that getting. I right, yeah. that, that double-sided tape around the window frame and I'm looking at my window now and that tape is still on there after like six years I can't get it off um so if you care about your interior decor these window inserts really are good and the windows are typically, are typically yeah. the most inefficient part of your house envelope you know they only have an R value of like two or something so putting these inserts in I think more than doubles there are value, which is good. Right. So the project itself is moving along. And so we'll be moving into the Methodist Church uh, November 8th with all of the equipment and getting those inserts um, built. 
it's an interesting process. So um, that's all I have for an update for the for the window dressers. Is there, is there like time slots to sign up for or ways to sign up? To there do is, this? and I I can send you. Um, I can send. I you will the, put the link in the chat, and also Cheryl, I'll put this up on the sign and Facebook as well. Oh, that'd be wonderful. Thank you, Bill. For, yeah, for for that. Um, it's not yeah, really. Um, it's not really town sponsored right now, um, so I was kind of hesitant, but um, but we'll okay, yeah, we can do it. But we are looking for volunteers right now, and um, next year I'm hoping that we'll be more, I'll be more proactive. And and right now I'm I'm in the learning stages. Dan knows what he's doing, but I'm just kind of I'm kind of in the learning, observing, helping stage. Yeah, so there, there, there are typically two four-hour shifts a day separated by an hour or half an hour in the middle of the day for lunch. Um, so you can choose when you go on when you go on to sign up, you'll typically be looking at either a morning shift or an afternoon slash evening shift. And, and, I think it's start, and I think it's starting on Tuesday. The here I'll give you some quick dates. It's starting on we're setting we're setting up the space on Monday the 8th. I think the first shift is the morning of Tuesday the 9th. And the last shift is the afternoon of Saturday the 13th. Great. And we have a bunch of University of Maine students also who are volunteering. So we're coordinating with that with that group, group of kids. And then so. each shift will have an expert who's done it before to, to help guide everyone through the, the process. But the way it's set up is awesome. The window dressers supply all of these like building stations. Like there's a there's a gluing station and then a cutting station and then the taping station, the wrapping station, and, and it's a little station. production line and it works really well. When we, in, in the past, we've done, you know, like three or 300 inserts a week at one mm -hmm. of our, a couple of our Bangor builds. Right, I think the Indian Island build was about 120 inserts around that, for just for and the you did folks. that in the Mitchell Center, didn't you? Mitchell Center, yeah. Which yeah. Is a bit of a squeeze, yeah. Right, right, <laughs> yeah. right. Good. So there's that, and then Maine Recycles Week. Um, I've I've been on like one meeting, but I know Bree and Belle have been talking to Travis and trying to figure out that. And I'm not really sure what's happening. So an update would be wonderful. Yeah, I can update on that. So um, in lieu of doing some more like organized central events, we decided that something that we could do that would be achievable this year, given the relatively short notice, would be to kind of um, amplify things that might already be happening and kind of, yeah. So we connected with uh, Kiwanis and they are, based on their really successful bike sale um, this summer, they are really interested in soliciting donations of bikes in any condition because they have folks who can um, repair them and they're able to, to take even really beat up bikes and strip parts and um, do great things with them. So we talked with the folks at Kiwanis and they're gonna have two kind of open houses at their auctions where people can drop off donations of household goods and bicycles. Um, Belle, I, I see you. That was purely um, twitchy fingers, not okay. anything. But I will say that um, we should connect with the um, both UMPD and Town of Orono Police Department um, around collecting bikes. UMPD used to do it a little more aggressively because they had that blue bike program. And that kind of was a flop, but if there's um, somebody else out there, Kiwanis willing to um, fix up bikes, then perhaps they might go around and collect some of the bikes that have been languishing at the, um, on the bike stands across campus. Yeah. Um... I think if we could coordinate that, they would be interested because they said their bike sale this summer, they said it sold out in like 20 minutes, like something like unbelievably quick. And obviously like some of that is the pandemic and more people wanting to bike, but there's also just a real demand. And 
they just recently got these folks um, involved in their organization who have the skills to repair. So I don't know if it's going to be a forever thing, but right now it's something they're really interested in. But that'd be great to connect over. Um, and another yeah. person, another person, if it if you're focused mostly on bikes, is Eric De Silva with the Bike Coalition. I mean, he might be somebody that has. I know he's got bike parts, and he's and he does a lot of stuff with. Um, with kids and puts bikes together. I sent a student over there this summer because um, he wanted a bike, an international student, um, wanted a bike but didn't have any way to pay for it. He went over and worked with Eric and they and Eric taught him how to put a bike up together with parts um, and gave him the bike because he was because he went in and worked on it and, and helped it. So he was very grateful and he did this this summer. So Eric might be a person that would be interested in in helping out with this at least i don't know what you know what he could do but yeah so the the emphasis is on like general like all the kinds of things that they accept at their auction um but um they were particularly interested because of the success they've had with bicycles so um we right now the the plan is for them to just like open their doors and kind of staff the barns on two different days during main recycles week and um, have people come drop off donations which helps them because they don't have to go out and receive donations and they can kind of process things um, the, that day and it kind of amplifies what they're already doing. Um, the Orna thrift shop is going to do something pretty similar where they um, you know they were just closed for for 18 months or so and have recently reopened um, just one day a week. And because they were closed for so many seasons, they're really short on winter items. And so we are kind of, sorry, toddler wants to see me. Um, so we're um, kind of framing this around, uh, she only wants to hide a winter clothing drive. Hi, come here, you wanna see everyone? Uh, so we're gonna try and solicit donations for winter stuff for them. Um, and Belle, I can't remember where we left things with you, but is it possible, they're gonna go on the main recycles week calendar, but is it possible to still get these events into the Orono newsletter? The Observer. The Observer, um, the time doesn't work out right because um, the Observer goes out in December and went out in September. Yeah. So, okay. Um, but we can put it on the Facebook page and on the, the website and stuff like that. That would be great. But I'll need the info to do that. Yeah, um, I, I can. Really agree along those lines. I'm, I'm working with the Sustainability Alliance on campus and with the, the student green groups and creating a web page of events for Main Recycle Week. Main Recycles Week. So it'd be great if you could send me all of that info and I can add it to the list. Yeah. And then, maybe, I, and then Bell, I could send you the link to that list. It'll be on the UMaine Office of Sustainability website. Yeah. That week is that week, November 13th. When does that week start? November 15th, 14th? I know it's after the window dressers. I always have to look. Um, I'll tell you. It is the 15th through 19th. 15 through 19, okay. So yeah, um, Belle and Dan, I can email you that information. I should have it all in my inbox. I feel kind of like Cheryl where um, I was trying to help Travis out with this event and then suddenly got um, became less of a helper and more of a like doer. So I'm still managing that role, but um, happy to get that information and send it to you because they're willing to do this, so we should help publicize it. Um, but uh, we have all kinds of great ideas for what we can do next year for Maine Recycles Week, kind of building on these events, which is wonderful. Um, and these organizations, we're really happy to partner. Um, so yeah. that's great. Maybe next year we can do November can just be weatherize Orono month. <laughs> Recycle month. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We've got time. Good, anything else? Any other, we've got a ton of stuff kind of going on here. Um, good. Um, the next item on the agenda is public comment, but I don't know if we have any public people here. I have no public in the... Um, yeah, we're not really on, right. Um, okay, that's just us then. 
Good. And we are a committee that likes to get out on time. <laughs> so is there anything else? Um, I think next, or, you know, next time we meet is December. What, I, what do you have it, Belle? It's like December 13th. It's a little bit earlier because of um, the holidays. No, November, not, not December, November. I keep, I'm skipping past my months. Sorry. Um... I'm muting you and muting you, trying to look and trying to operate with only one screen from home. And yeah, uh, it's November, that. November, November 13th is a Saturday. November 18th is when we're meeting next. And I will be unable to be there. Yeah. Um, that's right, because we switched it from the that we were trying to do Wednesdays. When we moved the week earlier, we couldn't do the Wednesday because planning board um, was a conflict. That's uh, so Bell is not going to be able to be at this meeting. I would, because that is our community dinner. dinner. We have, oh. if we do an hour long meeting, we could do it on Wednesday the seventeenth. If we do it for an hour, yes. I I'm with that if that works for everybody else. You can be there then. Okay. And I'm not sure what uh, will come up by then, but 17th. We'll actually be right in the middle of Maine Recycles Week. Perfect. And 17th. Okay. We'll just make it that then. So you'll go from one hour from five to six. We can do we can do five to six. That's easy. Okay, great. Well, Excellent. So Everybody should have an updated invite. Okay. Thank you, Belle, for all of that. Um, any, anything else? Any other comments, questions, concerns? No? All right. <laughs> Good. All right. Well, thank you, guys. And uh, we will see you later. I have one. Sorry, one more thing. <laughs> That's one. Don't hit that button yet. <laughs> Do you have an update on the uh, regional effort? The regional, the regional climate, climate effort. Climate sure. Effort. Um, so uh, Bangor and Orono signed the MOU. Um, we're working on the MOU with uh, the University of Maine. Bangor and Hudson have signed their MOU. Um, we kind of hit a little bit of a patch um, because we found some money uh, through Bangor area transportation systems to fund some data collection and um, some of the consulting work that we need done. And it uh, kind of ran afoul of our MOU. So we have worked to untangle that. And um, we have a meeting scheduled for next week. Bell and I will be meeting with Bangor folks and Vax um, to finalize the RFQ that is going to go out. I think the plan is still, um, our goal is to bring our community group together um, for the beginning of January um, to kind of kick that piece off. Uh, Bradley, VZ, and Hamden have all expressed interest in joining us. Um, Hamden is most definitely interest at the staff level. So I don't know how informal that will be. Uh, Bradley and VZ are more formally excited to join us. Good. Great news. Anything, Bell? Okay. Good. Thanks for that question, Dan. I actually forgot. Uh, thank, thank you, Sophie. Uh, I think that sounds very exciting does. Oh, and um, I had conversation with Evan Rickert, who is working with the Mitchell Center on some planning efforts, trying to figure out how they can support municipalities. Um, we are planning to get together when he gets back from California, but the idea being if we could link with the Mitchell Center to kind of help, that would be awesome. I think that's also a good idea, yeah. They've got tons of experience working in, in communities. Yes. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Good. Okay. Right now I'm going to hit the button. Hit the button. Have a good night, everyone. We'll see you later. Thank you.